Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that you speak to us, Lord, through your word. And we just pray, Father, that you would just we prepare our hearts for what you have for us today, Lord, individually and as a church. Father, please just give us hearts like good soil so that your word will just go in and bear fruit. So, Lord, we give you this time, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to take a bit of a detour today um, into the book of Acts. Um, and just to kind of set this up, because I know it's, it, we're kind of just jumping into halfway through a book, um, really what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the early life, really, of the church, or the life of the early church. And this is kind of a unique picture in some ways, because this is in some ways like a, a, a purer form of church than we might see in any other place in Scripture, really. Um, you know, we, we, we do have ideas of what church is like from, from other letters in Scripture, um, but this often, when you see the, the, the apostles writing in the letters, there's often, they're often dealing with some issue that's going on in the church. But this is, this is somewhere we get, just get a simple description of the life of the early church. Um, and I believe that this description of the church actually, for us, um, can act like a model on like what, for, for what church should be like um, and what our role in church should be. So we're going to see some things in the lives of the early believers that I think that we can imitate. We're going to see that as we go through this, these believers, this early church, they were a committed church. They were a biblical, well-taught church. They were a powerful church. They were a unified church, a generous church. They enjoyed life's simple blessings. They were a happy church. They were happy in God. And for us, this is almost like an opportunity to kind of think like, how do we compare to this church? And where we see that we are doing these same things, we can be encouraged. Um, but when we see that we're missing something, maybe that's a chance for us to put something into place in our lives. So just to kind of give us a bit of context here, um, this comes, this section in Scripture, so I'm just going to grab my Bible. This section in Scripture comes um, after Peter, Peter gives his sermon at Pentecost. Um, and this is important to note because the church starts after, the, the, this church begins after following a command. Notice, in, if, you, if you have your Bibles, you can look back up into 38, Peter calls the people to repent. And that's, it's important to note that this church, they began um, following a call to repent. The church was birthed, in some sense, by a group of people who repented. And just to give us some background here, so this, this, this takes place after Jesus has been crucified and raised, and this is before he ascends to heaven, and he gives his disciples orders to be his witnesses. In Judea, that's the local region where they were, a Samaria, that's the region around Judea, and then to the ends of the earth. That was Jesus' mission to the disciples. Um, but he tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit, um, who would empower them to accomplish the task. And then during, during one of the Jewish feast days, the Holy Spirit comes, and the disciples are filled with the Holy Spirit, and Peter preaches what we know as his Pentecost sermon on the day we celebrate his Pentecost. And in that sermon, he, kind of, he unpacks scriptures to explain what God was doing um, when, through his crucified Messiah, and that, and that now he was pouring out his Spirit. And he also said how the people should respond, and that's what you see in verse 38. He calls the people to repent. It kind of gives a summary. That, that verse 38 kind of gives a summary of his whole message in chapter 2. Peter said to them, Repent and let, everyone be, um, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. His message is this. Repent and have your sins washed away in the name of Jesus. And what is Repentance. Because it's something, it's, it's very important because his church was birthed in repentance. Well, repentance is turning away from sin to God. Jackie Pullinger, who was um, a kind of missionary to China, she, she, she talks about her interaction with one of the people she was um, sharing the gospel with. Um, and she said, this guy who never actually, this guy never actually went to church, he said he gave one of the best definitions of sin that she'd ever heard. He describes sin as going your own way. That is what sin is. Sin is when we choose to go our own way instead of following God's way. But repentance is the opposite. 
Repentance is when we turn from going from our own way and turning to follow God's way. And that is what these people did. Through Jesus, these people repented. Because it's through Jesus, his death on the cross, that paid for our forgiveness. So that when we can now turn to God, we don't face judgment, but we have his acceptance and favor because what Jesus has done for us. So we stop living our life our own way and turn to God. And on that day, 3,000 people responded to that call to repent and turn. And in verse 42 onwards, we get a picture now of what their lives look like once they turn from their way and turn to God's way. So in verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So the first thing we see here is that there, was, there are now some things that these people continue steadfastly in. Um, the idea of continuing steadfastly, um, some, of your translation, or some other translations might say devoted. The idea of continuing steadfast is that there are things now that you're going to be consistently single-minded about. These, you're like, it's the idea of commitment. There are now things that they are now committed to. These believers have repented and committed their lives to Jesus, and now as a result, the other commitments change. Right? If you commit yourself to Jesus, the other commitments are going to change. And that's what happened here. They, they, they're con- going to continue steadfastly, or they're going to be committed to four things that we see primarily. The apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. So apostles' doctrine, you might think of simply as scripture or the Bible. Um, fellowship, meeting together. Um, breaking of bread, um, probably communion, but also just eating together. And then pr- the prayers, praying together. So we can summarize their things that they were devoted to as the Bible, meeting together, eating together, and praying together. That's what they devoted themselves to. And we're going to look at each of those things. But before we do, I just want to look at this idea of commitment. Because I think it's really important that they didn't just do these things, but they, co- they continued steadfastly in them. Their commitments changed as a result of committing to Jesus. Because when we commit ourselves to Jesus, our priorities also should change in the same way that theirs does. Because when we turn to Jesus, it, we're no longer number one in our lives. He is. And when he's a priority, that means his priorities become my priorities. And that means he determines what my commitments are. And that's what happened in the believer's life. That's what should happen in our lives. But being committed or devoted to Jesus means there are things, other things, that we will and we won't be committed to. Uh, if you just think of the idea of commitment, you know, when you're committed to something, there are things sometimes, there are things that you're obliged to do to, to honor your commitment. And there are things that you might have to turn down so you can honor the commitment. For example, like, just to take an idea of like a, I think a, a simple example might be like an athlete, for example, who gets sponsored. If, if you get a sponsorship deal, you now have, an athlete now has an obligation to represent that brand, their brand, their sponsor. They're now expected, let's say a footballer who gets sponsored by a sports company, um, like a company, they're now expected to wear that brand. They're now expected to, to represent that brand. And they're also expected to not wear other brands. Okay, there's a kind of exclusive nature to commitment. So if someone, a sports player, like gets signed by Adidas, that means he, can't, he, ha- he has to wear Adidas and he can't go around wearing Nike. Right? He has to honor that commitment. There are things he has to do to honor that commitment and things he has to turn down to honor that commitment. Or like another ex- a common example is like marriage. If you're in a marriage, you're in that relationship committed exclusively to your spouse. If you're not, and you, that means you're unfaithful and that's hurtful because you made that commitment. And, and it's exactly the same thing with God. Scripture says, God yearns jealously over the spirit that he's placed in us. And that means that we can't live out our commitment to God and other things as well that would break our, that cause us to break our commitment with God. We have to choose our commitments. Or as Jesus would put it, we can't serve two masters. Either we hate the one and we love the other, or we're devoted to one and we despise the other, Matthew 6, 24. And in that context, Jesus is talking about choosing between God and money, but the same thing goes for anything. If we're committed to God, it means that we can't be committed to something else in the same way. Being committed to God means that he's the one who's going to determine our commitments and what we can, what we will and won't do. 
And commitment means making sacrifices. Because that idea of continuing steadfastly in consistent, single-minded commitment, that, that implies making sacrifices. That implies maybe sacrificing time or effort or finances. Again, so even to go back to the idea of an athlete, an athlete, to, make, to, to get good at their craft, athletes, they, they commit. An athlete will commit to their craft. They, they, their exercise, their, their diet is all geared towards one thing, to them perfecting their craft so they can perform at the highest level they can. And when they make that commitment to be good at their sport, there are things that they can't do. They, they, can't, they, they won't choose to eat that thing if they know that's going to cause them to perform worse. They won't stay out late if they know they've got a game tomorrow and they have to play. In the same way, they make sacrifices so they can be at the top of their craft. Well, in, in an even greater way, we make sacrifices to honor our commitment to God. And when we do commit, there's always the assumption, right, that if the thing we're committing to is worth the sacrifice. We're assuming, right, that we, if we are committing ourselves to something, that that thing must be important and worth sacrificing for. Because I know I, I can think of like a lot of things I've devoted myself to over the years or given, myself, you know, given my time for. And there are some things I look at it and I'm like, actually, yeah, that, that was worth my time. That, that was actually worth the, that was worth the effort I put into it. There's other things I'm like, that, that, that wasn't worth it. I shouldn't have done that. It's the same thing with any commitment. There, there are things that we, we can devote ourselves to lots of things, but is that thing, does that, is that thing worthy of our commitment or not? I mean, think, think of some of the things you've devoted yourself to over the years, you know, things you've given yourself to. Have, have those things, how have those things been worth it? Maybe they have been, maybe they haven't. Did those things deserve the commitment that you gave them? But as we go through this text, really what I want to think of is, what is worth our commitment? You know, what are the things that are worth our commitment to continue steadfastly in, in our lives? And first and foremost, that is Jesus. Thinking of the, what is worthy, the, the thing that comes to my mind is, is John's vision in heaven in Revelation, where he sees millions of angels that, that are so glorious that John himself was tempted to worship them when he saw them in his vision. And those angels, millions of them, are surrounding the throne of God. And what are they singing? Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy is Jesus because he's the lamb that was slain. And he's worthy of our commitment. No one, else could or, no one else could or would do what Jesus did. He's the one who gave his life for us so that we could be forgiven of our sin and enjoy life in his presence forever, eternally. He's the one who died but death could not hold him and he was raised to life again. And he's the one who loves us, continues to love us and invite us into his presence despite our failures. Isn't he worthy of our commitment? So number one, Jesus is worthy of our commitment. But then as we commit to him, I also want to think, okay, how do the other commitments we have in our lives or the things that we are currently committed to, how do they line up with our commitment to him? So maybe this could even be a chance to, to, to kind of reevaluate our own commitments and our priorities. You know, what are the things that we are kind of focusing on in our lives? Because it can be very easy to take, you know, to take more things on in life, even really good things. But the thing is, we don't want... Um, good things to take the priority of better things, um, which can happen very easily. Um, and I, as, I, as I want us to think about our personal our commitments, that this goes for us as a church, but also personally. Like there are some things that, as, as believers, we're all committed to as a church, and we're going to see some of those things in this text. But there are other things that actually the Lord has called us to individually. Like the Lord gives us individual giftings, He gives individual callings in our lives, and that comes, and with that might come different commitments. You know, if you're if the, Lord's called, um, if the Lord's called you to teaching, for example, it means that you have to really give yourself to study. That's a, commitment, that's a commitment you need to make. Or if the Lord's called you to hospitality, you need to make sure that you know, you're doing the things you need to do to be hospitable. You know? So there are different things that we have, individual callings and commitments that following the Lord might lead us to. And so as we, as we go through this, I just want us to kind of, may it be a chance for us to kind of evaluate um, as, a, as a church, also personally, our commitments and how they line up with um, our commitment to the Lord. Uh, but uh, another thing I want to just kind of keep in mind as we go through and look at these churches' kind of commitments is that we don't want to be just committed to these things for their own sake. Um, we said already that this church, they committed to these things that we're going to see because they had already committed themselves to Jesus. It's not that these things, we don't want these things to become ends in themselves. We don't want to commit ourselves to something just for the sake of it. 
they, they committed themselves to things as we should out of a desire to know Jesus, to grow in knowing him and doing his will. And I just want us to keep that in mind as we go, as we go through this. So the church has become committed to Jesus and now they've got some new commitments. And what are those commitments? Uh, Apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread and prayers, first of all. So we said the scripture, meeting together, eating together and praying together. Let's take that first one. Um, apostles teaching that's the first thing we see to commit themselves to uh, we see that this church was a bible-centered biblical church um, apostles teaching first of all who were the apostles uh, the apostles were the, the 12 apostles were disciples but these 12 were specifically chosen by jesus to be apostles um, and these were the ones who jesus chose apart from matthias who replaced judas after jesus had killed himself um, but they were given really the, the responsibility of being the leaders of the early church and these were the ones who Jesus told to be his witnesses, um, going to um, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, being his witnesses of his death and resurrection. And their teaching, what was their teaching? Well, their teaching, I think in short, was simply Jesus' teaching. And um, part of what Jesus called them to do was to teach. In Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, part of what he commanded them was to make disciples of all nations, but teaching them all that he commanded. And that's what the apostles were doing. Their teaching was really just the teaching of Jesus and following that command to teach um, all that he commanded. And why was this so important for the early believers to be committed to the apostles' teaching or the teaching of Jesus? Well, think about it, right? These people, they've been saved, um, as Peter says, out of this crooked generation. But even though they've been saved out of this crooked generation, there are still lots of thought patterns that are, are still stuck from the crooked generation they used to live in. So they now need, they now need to, a whole, their whole minds to be renewed. It's like they've been brought into this new life, but it's like, what now? It's like, what does it mean now for me to be a follower of Jesus? It's like, I understand that I am, but how does that look in my life? And that's why it's so important to be in the Bible. So we can learn, what does it mean for me to be a believer? You know, they might have had questions like, who was this Jesus? Like, what, what did he do? What was he like? What does it mean for me? And these are the same things that we can come to Scripture and ask. Because we don't have the apostles with us today, but where is their teaching now? Their teaching's in the Bible. Most of the New Testament is written by the apostles. Uh, most, of the new, most, of the letters we, most of the New Testament is letters written by the apostles. Um, and, these, and these believers, they want to renew their minds and figure out what life meant for them now. And wouldn't, isn't that something that is, we should just be so worth for ourselves to commit ourselves to? Reading, knowing, knowing scripture so that we can know what, who this Jesus is and what he's calling me to in my life. How much more secure and like sound and healthy would our lives be if we just had such a good grasp of that? And we can make the focus of our lives. You can imagine that they were reading it together, reading it with others, you know, going to trusted teachers who can help us understand it. You know, these, these will be really things worth our time and our commitment to grow in the knowledge of who God is, the relationship he wants to have with, have with us and how God wants to use us. That's the first thing we see them commit themselves to. The second thing is fellowship. Why is fellowship so important? Well, you can imagine teaching is important to renew your mind. But even if I know everything, Knowledge, and knowledge alone is not enough to sustain you on a difficult journey, right? This is why scripture says there's strength in fellowship. It says two are better than one because they have a good return for the labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity if anyone who falls and has no one to help him up. And a bit later it says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That's in Ecclesiastes of chapter four, verse nine to 12. There is strength in fellowship. So we, we need encouragement and at times also even the correction of friends. That's, that's part of what it means to be a believer. Because you can imagine like you're on a journey, right? And let's say you're going somewhere like the, the bus breaks down and you've got, you've got to walk a long way. That's a long, difficult journey. And even if I know exactly how to get where I'm going, at some point along that journey, I might turn back just because it's too hard. But if I've got someone with me, even though it's the exact same journey, 
something that was much more difficult actually becomes easier because I've got that, I've got that companionship and I've got that fellowship. You know, it's, it, it's, the journey's not any easier. It's the same length, same difficulty. I know all I need to know, but just having someone there to, to support, just to support, to strengthen, to pick me up when I fall, all those things, that's what, that's what fellowship is for. So we can walk on a journey together as believers in Christ. It's the exact same thing with being a disciple. Because when we, when we come to Christ, you know, life is better because we know Jesus. But it's not easier, right? It's be- it, it gets better for sure, but it's, it's definitely not easier. Firstly, because as I come to Christ, the Holy Spirit shows me more truth. And he shows me more of myself. And that, and that actually, having to deal with your sin all the time can be tiring. Yes, he, he helps you overcome it. He, he helps you overcome sin. But actually, there's actually a wrestle. In some ways, we wrestle more in, internally once we come to Christ, possibly. But then there's also the outside challenges. Because now that we actually commit to Christ, we live in a world which is not committed to Christ. There are battles that we have to fight just, just, just to live in the world. And that can be tiring and wearing. And we need to come back to fellowship just to be encouraged by one another and to support one another. There are times you might just need someone just to be there just to, to encourage or comfort us or just to give us counsel and just help us along. So fellowship is important because we need encouragement. And fellowship is also important because we need, to, um, because in a, in a big way, we're formed by the company that we keep. You know, like, whether we like it or not, the company we keep has an influence on us, for better or for worse. Um, and so for better, like if we, if, we want, if we believe in Jesus and we hang around other people who do, um, that's going to help us stay grounded. As scripture says in Proverbs 27, like iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Like part of what we do when we come together is we sharpen each other as believers. And if we start to drift, you know, we've got people in our lives who can come alongside us and be like, actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help us get back on track. And that's part of what fellowship is for. And as, as Paul says, you know, like, don't be deceived. Bad, bad company ruins good morals. Because so, the same thing goes the other way. Whilst we, if we are around people who are going to support us, that's going to help us. We have to be careful because if we, are, if we avoid that and we're always around people who don't believe, follow Jesus, that's also going to influence us, right? So we, we need to make sure that we're in community, because that, that's how God has designed his church um, to function. So they were taught, they were taught church, they were um, a close church, um, making a, a committed to fellowship. They're also committed to the breaking of bread. And uh, now this could, this could simply refer to eating together, um, but it probably also refers to communion, which is often referred to in scripture as breaking of bread. Uh, the believers did both things. The believers did just eat together, but they also did take communion together. So eating, to, like eating together, this kind of shows not just that they were in fellowship, but because it shows the closeness of the fellowship they had. Because in ancient culture, and, and still today to some degree, sharing a table with someone is kind of the most intimate fellowship you can kind of have with someone. And that shows this, this church, they weren't just like fe- in fellowship sometimes, they were like a close-knit fellowship. They, they, were, they were really close to each other and shared like the most intimate parts of their lives with each other. And they also like, took communion together, like, in their fellowship, they were, they were, it was centered around the gospel. That's why we take communion. We take communion to remember what Jesus, what Jesus did for us. So their, their, their fellowship was really close-knit, and it was also it was centered around the gospel. And the fourth thing we see they were committed to, or continued steadfastly, was prayers. And what is prayer? In the simplest sense, it's just, it's just communicating with God. Prayer is just communicating with God. And this is important for, well, I, well, I can think of as two main reasons. I'm, I'm sure there are many more. Firstly, prayer is important because this is how we enjoy a relationship with the Lord. Prayer is the main way that we enjoy a relationship with the Lord. And this is important because to be saved means not just to go to heaven and avoid judgment, but it means to come to God. It means to come to a person. Or as I like the way Peter says it in, first P- in, in, in his letter, in 1 Peter 3.18. He said, Christ suffered for our sins to bring us to God. So Christ suffered for our sins so we could have forgiveness. 
But the end of that forgiveness is so that we can be restored into a relationship with God, be restored into a relationship with a person. And as part of that relationship, that involves communicating. That's how we enjoy, our, our, that's how we enjoy friendship with someone. We communicate with them. And that's, that's the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. And that's one of the reasons that we pray. Because God is a God who speaks and he's a God who hears. And what is cooler than speaking to God and knowing that God hears you? What is cooler than hearing God speak to you? Like the God of the universe who creates all things has such a care even over every single person. Every single one of us, he cares deeply for. That it's, it's, not like, it's not like he rushes when he hears your prayers. It's like he's, he's intently listening to you when you pray. He cares. And that is the most amazing thought to me, that the God of the universe would have such a care for me. And, but the thing is, it's, th- it's through prayer that really we see this, I think, in the, most, in the, main, in the main way, and grow. Because even if I've got an intellectual knowledge of that, that's one thing. When I actually pray to God and I see him answer a prayer, it's like God actually heard me, right? And that's a, that, that's a diff- it's kind of, before I just saw it, but now I've actually experienced the love of God. Now I've actually seen it in my life for myself. Or it's like, when I, th- when I think, I've heard, when, when God's spoken to me, it's like, okay, no, this isn't just, like, this isn't just a God who speaks. It's like, actually, no, I've, I've heard from God that God actually does want a relationship with me. He does want to communicate with me. And it's through prayer that we speak to God and hear from God. And this is how we enjoy our relationship with him and really live in the experience of it in the main way. So on the one hand, we pray to enjoy our relationship with God. But on the second hand, we also pray to accomplish God's will. Right? Because we already said that Jesus gave the apostles a mission. And the same mission he gave the apostles is a mission for all of us, to be his witnesses to the whole world. He called a group of, just a small group of people, most of them uneducated, not special people, and said, I want you to go and reach the whole world. That is an impossible mission. He gave them an impossible mission, but he didn't expect them to accomplish it on their own strength. Right? He didn't expect them to go and make their own strategies and plans and be good enough to go and just f- fulfill this mission that Jesus had. He wanted them to call upon him. He wanted them to ask for his help and to ne- and they, because they needed his empowerment. And one of, the ways that we, one of the ways that we see God do the impossible through us is through prayer. We ask him. We ask him because he's the strong one. God is the one who's omnipotent. And if we're able, as I liked, someone said, um, as someone said about George Muller, if we would be like him, who, who was wise enough to take hold of the arm of omnipotence, like, what, could we, what couldn't we do, right? If we, if we would, be, would we be wise enough to take hold of the arm of an almighty God <laughs> to accomplish what we can't accomplish on our own strength? He didn't expect them to do it on our own strength, and he doesn't expect us to do the things he calls, to, uh, he calls us to on our own strength either. One of the ways that we accomplish his impossible will for us is through prayer. That goes for these believers, and it goes for us too. So just think maybe, like, what, what even the things in our life that we need the help of God for? What are some of the things in our life that we just think, like, I don't know how this is ever going to shift? Well, maybe, like, what if we just got by ourselves or with some others and just think, okay, I'm going to really commit this to prayer. I've heard someone else say, you know, we can have whatever we're willing to labor in prayer for. And, like, I think that's so true. Like, what if we just really committed all those things that seem so impossible to us for God, the things that he's calling us to or the things that we just need help with? That's what this church did. So those are the four things that this church kind of continued in. But there are also other things, even though it doesn't say specifically they committed themselves to these things, that we saw that we, we see that this church, um, we see this church was committed to. And we see what this church was like going on in the next verses. So if you look at verse 43, it says, Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. So we see wonders and signs being done through these apostles. And we see at this church, it was, it was all of those things, but it was also a powerful church. God was present in power among his church. And just to kind of um, unpack this a little bit, uh, with that phrase, signs and wonders, or wonders and signs, it's actually a, it's quite, it's quite a specific phrase um, used to describe a, a particular type of miracle. Um, 
in, in basically, signs and wonders were miracles that God does to show his power and authority over the enemy and also to call people to himself. In the Old Testament, signs and wonders, it nearly always refers to the miracles that God did in Egypt. Uh, it refers to the, the, those, big, those big miraculous things that God did to call his people out of Egypt as he judged the enemy, uh, judged the enemy nation. And basically what we, what we see is that the picture is that God is going, he's invading an enemy nation who took his people captive, he's showing his power over the enemy nation, and he's calling his people out. That's the picture of what we saw happen um, in the Exodus. That's what, that is what God does through signs and wonders, that specific phrase. But when we come to the New Testament, Jesus is doing the same thing, but instead of a, um, a physical nation, God does that with a spiritual enemy. Jesus does miracles to demonstrate his power over sin and death. And this is why signs and wonders are often connected, uh, the, are miracles that Jesus does, connected with the preaching of the gospel. This is the pattern. Jesus would preach good news that through his death on the cross, he's defeated sin and death. And that if we believe in him, we can have new life. But he would also demonstrate that victory over sin and death by doing miracles like healing, which shows that through him, he undoes the power of sin and death. He was, it's like, he was showing up and he was like invading enemy territory, right? Because this world is in darkness. This world is, is suffering under the effects of sin. That's why, that's why there is sickness. Jesus is coming up and saying, look, I'm here to invade and I'm here to undo the damage of the enemy. I'm here to, to show my victory over the dark power of darkness, of sin and death. That was why Jesus did miracles. But G when Jesus ascended into heaven, his work in showing his victory over darkness wasn't done he continued to work through the apostles by his Holy Spirit. That's why when we see the apostles and we see it throughout the book of Acts, the apostles, they're, they're doing the same, exact same thing Jesus did. They're calling people out of enemy territory by pro proclaiming the good news of Jesus, that he's triumphed over sin and death, but they're also showing it by doing powerful miracles. As God showed his power over sin and death, these people, um, but as God showed his power over sin and death, um, and like these people who saw those signs and wonders in Egypt, those, the, everyone who would see those miracles the apostles were doing, they had to make, kind of make a choice in some way. Because as God judged Egypt and he showed his power over Egypt, the people in Egypt and the Israelites who had a choice, it's like, are you going to follow me or are you going to stay in this defeated nation? It's like, are you going to follow a victorious God or are you going to stay in the, the land of defeated darkness? That is what, that is kind of, um, that's kind of the choice that God was putting forward to people as he, was, as he was working miracles through the apostles. And the question I guess you might ask is, okay, that was the apostles, but then is, does God still want to work like that today? Like, does God still want to do those powerful things? Well, here's how, I, here's how I think of it. I think, well, why did God do those things then? Well, we saw Jesus, he healed, because one, it says many times in scripture, he just had compassion. You know, he said his compassion will grow warm and, and he will perform healing. And two, as we've seen, he wants to show his power over the enemy and call people to follow him. Okay, so now I think, does Jesus, is he still compassionate? Yes. Does he still want to show his power over the enemy? Yes. So I don't see any reason why he wouldn't still be doing these things today. And I think that's why he does call us to be a church that moves in the same power that we see here through the apostles. So God calls um, this church, and our, I believe the church today, to be a powerful church, a church that operates in his power and where he's seen to be powerful and present among his people. But then in the next verse, in verse 44, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as any had need. Now, even though God wants to show himself powerful through signs and wonders, God also wants to show himself present in his church, maybe through some less obvious ways. And two of those ways that God wants to show his presence among his church is through unity and generosity. And that's what we see in this church here. I really want us to not underestimate what God wants to do, what God wants to show the world through the unity of the church. Think about it, right? These, these people, it's they had all things in common. These people might have come from completely different walks of life, completely different backgrounds, completely different like 
financial positions, some were richer, some were poorer, some might have been like slaves, some might have been like, um, like owners of huge bits, huge amounts of land, but they had all things in common. This was a miraculous kind of unity. And how does this happen? Well, unity is difficult because people, if we're all following our own way, and then our ways don't line up with each other, we're going to clash. So what do we need to be unified? We need something that's bigger than ourselves. So this church has come to, has come to believe in Jesus, who's bigger than themselves, and now they're unified in him. And that means now they can be unified with each other. And that is the, that's the kind of the miracle of unity. It shows that there is something which is greater than ourselves. So when we are unified, that is what people, that's what people are seeing. There is something here which is bigger than any one person. They were united by the common purpose of Christ. And this is Jesus' heart for his church to be unified. In fact, this is one of the things that Jesus prayed for his church, that we would be one. Jesus prayed that we would be one. In fact, he says that in John chapter 17, that when we're one, when we are unified, that's when people will know that Jesus was sent by God. That's the thing that Jesus said. This is what's going to show people that Jesus is the, the real, that Jesus is the real deal. When people see his church unified, that's going to show this, that these people really believe there's something bigger than them. Jesus wants to show himself present among his church in our unity, but also our generosity. And what I love about this church is that they didn't just talk unity, right? It's one thing to say, oh, we've got all things in common, or like we're unified. They really lived it, even when that meant sharing their possessions. It says this church had all things in common and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them all as anyone had need. They didn't just talk unity, they, they meant it. And that meant to the point where they didn't count their possessions as their own. They were willing to sell their, their things to help others in need. And now, I guess th this happens probably for a few reasons. One, they follow Jesus' example. Um, scripture says, that, um, when Paul's speaking to the Corinthians, he says, Jesus was rich spiritually speaking, being God, the king of heaven. But for our sake, he became poor, dying on a cross so we could be forgiven. So Jesus was rich, but for our sake became poor. And these people were so struck by that, that reality that they were willing to be generous with each other. Right? I, I want us to see that because generosity, our generosity is it's in the gospel. G that's, that's what Paul is saying. It's like, Paul is saying you should be generous because Jesus was generous with you in the gospel. So generosity is in the gospel, and they've received that, really, and, and they're, they're living it out. And also, we just see this church, they, they follow the example of Jesus in the gospel, but they also, the, they also follow the teaching of Jesus. Jesus taught so many times on being generous and giving up our possessions for each other. Just a few examples. In Luke 12, 33, he says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. And then in Matthew um, 6, verse 31 to 33, he says, don't worry. He says, look, don't worry. Don't, don't worry saying, what shall we eat and what shall we drink or what shall we wear? He says, look, the pagans or the Gentiles run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. See, Jesus taught that we can sell our possessions and not be concerned over those things because God has given us a greater security. God says he will take care of us now and he's got, we've, got an eternal security, we've got an eternal home that we look forward to. And so we, we can be confident in him. We don't have to worry. And that means we're, we're freer now to be generous with our possessions. There is freedom in generosity. When we trust in Jesus, he gives us a secure future. And that means I'm freer now to live my life, like free from worrying about stuff. You know, I'm not, not sure if you heard, you heard like that phrase, like, um, like financial freedom. And the idea is like, you get so, you have enough money, so you're, you, you don't have to feel like you're enslaved. Like you don't have to feel like you're enslaved to your job. So you have enough money to do all the things you want to do. You got financial freedom. To me, this is real financial freedom. Not, not having enough money <laughs> so that I can do what I want to do, but actually being free from the feeling like I, I need my money. Because this is freedom that whether I have a lot or little, I'm not concerned about my well-being. 
I know that God's got me. That, that's real freedom. And that's the kind of freedom that these people had that enabled them to be generous with each other. So they're a generous church. And then just the, the last few things. Um, we just see in verse 46 to 47, we see that uh, kind of just a few examples of their daily life. What, what it looked like for them day to day. It said, it says, so they're qu- continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Um, so this is just a, some more details of exactly what it looked like. So again, when they said that they were committed to the apostles' teaching, they meant it. They, went to the da- they were in the temple daily, l- g- gathering together to pray, to listen to the apostles' teaching. Like, they, they were really committed to growing in the knowledge of God and his will. Um, and this idea of, like, going up to the temple, um, so some, they, they might go up in larger groups, maybe, to pray. Um, and I can imagine, like, the, disciple, the disciples would have been there because they would have been, that's, that's probably where they would have do, done their teaching. Uh, that, that's where Jesus, often in his ministry, did his teaching. So I imagine that that's what the, that's what the believers were doing. They were going to go to the temple and listen to the teaching of the apostles gathered together. And they did that every day or daily. That's the level of their commitment to the apostles' teaching. And also they, they just shared, again, we see they shared close fellowship, breaking bread from house to house. They shared their homes with each other. And I, I love the next bit, which says, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Some of your translations, uh, translation might say sincerity of heart or sincere hearts or, um, or generous hearts. But... The idea, I think, is just simple, simply that they receive their food with gladness as a simple blessing from God. Like, I like this, that one of the things that marked the early church was that they were just happy about their food. Like, and I love it because, you know, they responded, they repented because of the message that a day is coming when the Lord's going to return, he's going to judge the world. So don't waste your life storing up possessions and keeping your things safe. Like, make sure you're right with God and doing his will, and that's what's important. And you would think that that message might make you, like, care less about the things in this world. But that's not what happens. As the people, in, in some sense, worry less about the things in this world and are more focused on, on the future, they're, in some sense, we're freer to enjoy life's simple blessings now, right? Like, the world's coming to an end, <laughs> And my future is secure in Jesus, so I don't have to worry about my possessions. So I'm just free to enjoy life's simple blessings like food. And then what else do we see? We see the early believers, they were known for praising God. In verse 47 says they praised God. You praise what makes you happy, right? You praise what makes you happy. And they praise God because God made them happy. And I like that because it, it, it shows that all these things that they were doing just in case you thought that they were doing them just because they felt they had to, they, they're not. All these things, being a generous church, being unified, being committed to teaching, praying, meeting together, in case you thought that they were doing those things just because they had to, they weren't. They were doing those things because they were happy in their God. And these things made them happy. These acts of devotion, they, they want, it wasn't like a duty for them. They did these things because they were happy in their God. And again, you would think that if God called people to live such a simple life, like giving up your possessions, God called you to maybe give up those things you were committed to before, give up those things that you felt you had to do for, for, your, for your sense of purpose, or you, you had to give up time for the things that you used, to do, you used to do for entertainment. And instead, I want you to be meeting together, focusing on the church. And instead, God says he wants us to be focusing on his mission. In case you thought that those things would make life less enjoyable, God is saying, look, they don't. They don't. These believers, they were more joyful than before after committing their lives to Jesus. They were more joyful before than after leaving those things behind and focusing on God's things. And this is just, this is just a real message to us that God brings more joy to us than the things of this world. And as the church was doing all these things, it said they attracted the favor of outsiders or no, he says they, were, they, were, they had favor among all the people. And the idea is that they had, they had, they had admiration and respect, like even from people from outsiders, even from people who didn't believe. 
And it doesn't say that they tried to gain favor. It was just God's grace upon them as they were just being the church that God called them to be. Like it wasn't like, it wasn't like they, were, they were doing things specifically to, to try and get favor from, from the world around them. They were just focusing on God, focusing on the things that God called them to commit to. And as God did that, as they did that, God gave them grace that people around them were actually admiring them, respecting them. And there will, there will come a time in the book of Acts and in our lives when, yes, living out God's commands, it, it, won't, it won't lead to favor of people from outside. But that doesn't change that we're called to commit to the things God calls us to commit to. This church, wasn't, this church would, whether now, when they're experiencing God's favor, or later, when actually they're being persecuted for being the church God called them to be, either way, they're still going to commit to the things God calls them to commit to. But this is really, this is kind of where the, where the, where the passage ends. That it says, the Lord was adding, in the next verse it says, the Lord was adding daily to the church those who were being saved. So I get the picture from this that as, as the church was having this favor from outside, they were seeing like there's something different going on here. Like these people, they're believing in something that's real. It's like they're seeing the real commitment of these believers. They're seeing the powerful things God is doing among his, his people. They're seeing like the simple lifestyle, the unity. They're seeing like then people just praise God. And they're like, God is really moving. God is really present here. And God is really moving here. And then as they do that, people get added to the church. The Lord adds to, the ch- the Lord adds to his church. The, it says the Lord adds to their number. It wasn't, it wasn't anything they kind of had to set out to do, right? It wasn't their strategy that they came up with. It wasn't them trying to figure out, okay, how can we get people to come to our church today? It was like, we're just going to be the church who God calls us to be. I'm just going to do the things that God is calling me to do. And as I, as I, as I focus on that, God's going to do the rest. So I love this picture of church. The Lord adds to their number. And so as we kind of close, I just want us to think like, like individually as in a church, like what, what if our lives look like this? Like what if we, we were committed what if we were like just focused on being biblical and knowing God and knowing his will? What if we were just seeking God to move in power? What if we were just seeking unity? And what if we were living generously, just enjoying life's simple blessings and being praising God and being happy in our gods? Like how blessed would our lives be, one? And then two, like what, would God, what might God do for us individually and as a church? So maybe we can just take that to prayer now. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words. We thank you for this picture, Lord, of church that you've kept for us. And Lord, I just pray, uh, Lord, that, Lord, that where, we are, where we are matching up, Lord, in, into this model, Lord, that we'd be encouraged. But Lord, where we're not, Lord, that you would, just, that you would, that you would put that right. Lord, so we would be the church that you call us to be. That we'd be the people who you call us to be. That our commitments would be the commitments that you want us to have. So Lord, yeah, we, Lord, we repent. You know, Lord, we, we, want to, we turn from our own way. We turn from our own way, Lord. And we want to, we want to follow you and give our lives to you. And we, we want you to be, be our priority. We need to determine what our lives look like. So please just make us a church that you want us to be, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.